Hello and welcome, my mathematical leaves. Today we're gonna have a look at ADEF's video, which is the math behind the unluckiest shiny hunts of all time. Let's get mathematical. If I asked you the odds of finding a shiny Pokemon, what would you say? I would say too uh, low, too low, not too high, too low. I think the shiny Pokemon should be. You should have a good chance of encountering one in a normal playthrough, so yeah, for that they are a bit too high, which is a bit sad. I bet some people would disagree with that, though. Probably about 1 in 8,000, right? But what if I asked a slightly different question? What if I asked you the odds of finding a shiny Pokémon within 2,500 encounters, or after 10,000? It's not so simple now, is it? Starting in Generation 2, Pokémon could be... I mean, the thing is, after you already had 10,000 encounters, the odds of actually finding a shiny are just the same. They are calculated for each separate encounter, and thus they never change, no matter how many you encounter. It's always the same. Screaming? Oh, oh my god! Oh! Shiny Reggie Rock! People love to quote statistics about these last few days, Scoodle has just not really- Shinies? I'll give you a grand if it's red. Just play the intro! I really do not understand the screaming, honestly. I shiny hunt myself, and when I find a shiny, I don't do it live. Okay, but whenever I... My camera is very green thanks to his screen. Oh well. When I find a child, my reaction is like, Oh, cool. That's kind of it. Yeah. I have seen that a lot. People think that things become more likely the more often stuff happens. Like, the more Pokemon you encounter, the more likely it becomes to find a shiny. That's what a lot of people think, but that is simply not true. I've always found shiny hunting fascinating. People are willing to embark on these super long hunts for one specific shiny Pokemon, knowing damn well it might never shine. Now, of course, we know that the probability of the Pokemon never shining is essentially zero, even with tiny odds like 1 in 8,000, but how do we know that? How do we know that it will shine eventually? It feels intuitively correct, but it's one of those problems where when you start throwing your brain at it, it is shockingly counterintuitive. It starts to feel like one of those things where you just say, Oh, well, that, it's, that's just how it is. But this question of how likely it is for something with a certain probability to take a certain number of attempts, the question of a probability of a probability, is pretty tough. But shiny hunters say things about odds with such confidence. They seem to know when they should feel good about a hunt or start feeling bad about a hunt. I want to understand everything there is to know about shiny hunting and the probabilities and maths behind it. And I want you to understand also. My hope for this video is that it can serve as a sort of Bible for talking about probabilities in shiny hunting and what all the numbers mean. I wanted to start making this video about six months ago, but it just didn't feel right to start making a video about full odds shiny hunting without first experiencing the odds for myself. So about six months ago, I embarked on my first step. Okay, crazy. Yeah, the thing is, I, I really hate it when people say that the chance of one in a hundred, so one percent, is that after you encounter a hundred things, one of the th things must be. No, it must not be. Because if you encounter a hundred things, every one of these things has a one percent probability of being the thing you are searching for. It doesn't get more likely. So even in a million, you don't have to encounter. Yes. There is a certain likeness that with more encounters you will eventually get to a shiny in this case. But it's not a guarantee or anything. That's not how this works. Never full odds shiny hunt in preparation for this video. 
I wanted to experience the probabilities of shiny hunting firsthand. I really wanted to get into the mindset of a shiny hunter. Not only that, but this way we'd have hard data and firsthand stats to analyze in this video. As an added bonus along the way, I'll show you some clips of certain shiny hunts from other shiny hunters that are so unrealistic they will make you doubt reality. But before we do any of that, deciding to do a hunt of my own begs the question, what Pokemon am I gonna hunt? And in It would be so funny if he finds it first encounter, just like goes into the grass, oh, there it is. That would <laughs> throw away all the things he just said, because you cannot gather data from that. That would just be extremely lucky. Though that in and of itself could be the data, because it's just a mathematical probability and it can happen. Technically, every, well, except shiny love Pokemon, every Pokemon you encounter could be shiny. You could technically have a run where that happens, that you only encounter shinies. It is very unlikely, of course, but it could happen. There is no, like, there's nothing that says it can't. In what game? The first decision I made is that I wanted to do this hunt in a game in which the odds were still 1 in 8192. Starting in Generation 6, the odds were effectively doubled to 1 in 4096 instead. So that just meant I wanted to do the hunt in a game before Gen 6. Regular viewers of this channel will not be shocked to find out that Gen 3 is my favorite Pokémon generation, so we'll do the hunt in those games. Wait, hang on, everybody knows the odds are 1 in 8192, but where does that number even come from? If this video is to be the definitive resource on shiny hunting probabilities that I'm claiming it to be, we should probably establish where that number comes from. In Generation 2, the generation that introduced shinies, a Pokémon will be shiny according to its DVs. DVs, or determinant values, are the precursor to IVs. Each Pokémon has a randomly generated DV for each of its stats. If the Pokémon's Defense, Special, and Speed DVs are all equal to 10, and the Attack DV is 2, 3, 6, 7, 10, 11, 14, or 15, then the Pokémon will be shiny. The odds of all of these things coinciding is 1 in 8192. Coincidentally, due to the fact that Pokémon in Generation 1 also calculate their stats based on DVs, if you catch a Pokémon in red, blue, or yellow that has these DVs and then trade that Pokémon into Generation 2, Gold, Silver, or Crystal, the Pokémon will be shiny even though you caught it in a Generation 1 game, a game before shinies existed. So that's pretty cool. From Generation 3 onwards, the shiny calculation is instead based on Personality Value, or PID. Every that thing is, I also heard a lot of people say that Generation 1 actually had shinies, you just couldn't see it. No. No, it did not have shinies. They were not programmed in, it was just a coincidence that they could be shiny after trading them up. That doesn't mean they are shiny in Gen 1, they just have the stats, the data behind it. So Gen 2 reads them as shiny, but Gen 1 does not have shinies. It doesn't read them as shiny, it just reads the stats. Every Pokémon is given a randomly generated personality value. This value is represented by a 32-bit unsigned binary integer and it determines a lot about an individual Pokémon, including shininess. Additionally, when you create your file, your trainer is given a trainer ID, which you can check on the trainer card, and a secret ID, which is not a player-facing number. The function that determines if a Pokémon is shiny or not leverages the trainer ID, secret ID, and the Pokémon's personality value. The numbers are combined using something called an XOR, an exclusive OR function. I covered XOR in my video on making a computer inside Pokémon Sapphire, so watch that video if you need a primer, but basically, when comparing two binary values, an XOR function returns a 1, or a true, only if one or the other value is one, but not when both are one, and not when both are zero. To determine if a Pokémon is shiny or not, the game performs a bitwise XOR on the trainer ID, the secret ID, the first 16 bits of the Pokémon's personality value, and the second 16 bits of the personality value. Bitwise means, rather than comparing the entire number all at once, the function lines the two numbers up and compares them bit by bit, literally, returning a new bit in the sum in each place. Once all four numbers have been XORed together, the result is a new 16-bit integer. If the value of that number is less than 8, that is a value of 0 through 7, then the Pokémon is shiny. For all other values, it isn't. 
A 16-bit integer has 65,536 possible values, meaning our eight possible shiny values divided by that total number of possible values gives odds of 1 in 8,192 when simplified. From generation 6 onwards, the same function is performed, but the Pokémon is shiny now if the value is less than 16 instead of 8, so that effectively doubles the chances of it being shiny, hence the new 1 in 4096 odds. Okay, now we know how a shiny Pokémon is generated in the first place, but the question still remains, who do I want to hunt? Funnily enough, XY was the first shiny I encountered in the wild. It was, uh, the name is escaping me. It was that Iron Ant thing. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, the name is escaping me. I don't know. But yeah, it jumped out of a bush. Just like that. And it was shiny. It was kind of cool. Hunt. For me, the choice was obvious. Having never done a full odds hunt before, I wanted my first one to be special. I wanted to do it for my favorite Pokemon. As someone who grew up as a certified hashtag dinosaur kid, my list of favorite Pokemon looks like this. Aren't they great? Uh, I mean, there is a Gen 3 Mon he can get in here, so. I bet he's not doing any of those. Pop among this list though, is this king. I mean, he's just perfect. I love Pokemon that look like Godzilla, like Tyranitar and Aggron are both at the top of the list, but it's Mecha Godzilla, dude. Aggron is per, I mean, he's just perfect. He's perfect. Unfortunately, there aren't any Aggron encounters in generation three. So I decided to go for the earliest member of the line that you could find the earliest on in the game, Aeron. Now, the in-game mechanics I used to streamline this hunt changed a lot over the course of the hunt, but eventually I settled on this. I started the hunt in Ruby and Sapphire in February 2024, but I knew that Emerald would be best because out-of-battle abilities like Magnet Pull would start to work out of battle. I did the first thousand or so encounters solo hunting in Ruby, but eventually Party Arlie and an IRL neighbor of mine each lent me a copy of Emerald. Now, this hunt is taking place in B2F of Granite Cave, Here's the encounter table for this area. I had a fainted nose. That is not too bad if you're looking for an Aaron. Wait, the rates are the same in each game. Like even the third edition doesn't change the, okay. Yeah, that's one thing I kinda have to complain about when it comes to Pokemon. Although Scarlet Violet did it a bit better. The version differences are just, so minuscule nowadays it's it's a bit sad like black and white were cool with the different places you had and ruby and sapphire with the two different uh evil teams that was cool but nowadays it's just a handful of pokemon and that's it and you even have like methods to get these pokemon without trading so yeah sure the two schools that was something and miraidon and koraidon and the different Paradox Pokemon, so Scarlet Violet was upping the game again, which is good. I hope Gen 10 does more different, though. It was passed in the lead of my party so that its ability, Magnet Pole, would increase the odds of generating a Steel type when possible. Talo would be the Pokemon I'd send out to battle, as it's faster than any of the Pokemon in B2F of Granite Cave, so running away wouldn't be an issue. The Talo was level 12 and I had a Repel active, so that way I would prevent any Pokemon level 11 or lower from appearing. The Repel trick plus level 12 Talo would mean I could only generate Sableye or Aeron. Additionally, Magnet Pole forces a Steel Encounter when an encounter is generated 50% of the time. This means that 50% of the time you'd get an Aeron guaranteed. The other 50% of the slots would be occupied by two-thirds Aeron and one-third Sableye, the normal encounter table. This meant, on average, I'd see about 83% Aeron. The final two steps to the setup that came later on were adding in a white flute to increase the overall encounter rate by 50% and the acro bike so that I could hop in place without moving around, making the hunt physically less demanding on my thumbs. Thank God. Through all of this setup, I came to appreciate the hard work that goes into setting up a hunt properly. You can always just run around in the grass and hope for the best, but a deep understanding of Pokemon's many interconnected mechanics are essential for shiny hunting and it means you can make hunting far more favorable.
With all the perfect pieces now in play, the hunt truly hit its stride. I streamed the vast majority of the encounters to my Twitch channel, but I also wound up eventually doing some offline hunting too. By the month of June, I had done 3,800 encounters on and off while working on other projects. Enter June 21st, 2024. My stream on June 21st started off as many of my streams do. I booted up a difficult challenge run of a game I really like. Today's main course was a randomizer in Ocarina of Time, but this particular rando is called No Logic, which means that there is no logic behind where items are hidden. It's truly completely random, meaning that an item you need to complete the rando seed, say the bow, might be locked behind needing the bow, rendering the seed Was that just a Deku shield in the Skotola? Oh, that sounds awful and fun. Incompletable. I've had very few incompletable seeds, and I have done a lot of no logic randos, but it has happened. The seed became very clearly tough very quickly. Within the span of an hour, I proved definitively that the seed was unbeatable. A fun challenge and a silly thing to prove in its own right, but a stream of just a little over an hour wasn't really long enough to call a full stream, so what now? This is when a moderator of mine gave me the suggestion. What about some Aeron encounters? It had been almost a month since I did some proper encounter grinding. Given that, I thought, why not? I mean, it's time to get back on the saddle. I gotta get this hunt done so that I can make this video. Let's do it. So I set up both my games, started around Encounter 3800, and started hopping along on that acro bike. Then, about 150 encounters later, this happened. Yes, Haosu, that's correct. I wish I saved that stream. <gasps> there it is! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god, dude! Oh my god! Let's go! <laughs> no shot. Hello, other person. Shot, dude. Go! No shot. I like couldn't actually that's like full odds that is early definitely okay let's turn that audio on oh, hey don't don't say anything yet let's go now oh, let's just throw great balls dude yeah <laughs> Yes! Save that game, baby! Oh my god, I can make the video. Holy, dude. After I found the Aeron and cut stream, I was riding a high for like two days. It was awesome. I completely understand it now. Shiny hunting rocks. I then, over the course of the next few streams, beat all of Pokemon Emerald with just that shiny Aeron and his evolutions, which was super fun. And you can see that full playthrough on my second channel, which is linked in the description. But now we have sweet, sweet data. That's a link to this video in the description here as well. Leave a like and a subscribe over there and a comment. That would be cool. So how lucky was this Aaron? I was definitely way under odds, which was relatively unexpected, but is 3,967 encounters good? If so, how good? Here we go. In order to be sure that the information I present in this section of the video is as accurate as possible, because I'll be the first to tell you I'm not the best at probabilities and statistics, uh, I called upon the help of my actual real-life friend, Dr. Jimmy Poopins. And if you've seen this video from- That is a gorgeous name! From Summoning Salt, Yes, it's the same guy. Jimmy has an actual PhD in statistics and applied probability. So occasionally throughout this section, little notes will show up from Jimmy that look like this. And if it ever shows up, read it. It will be interesting. And truly, I cannot thank Jimmy enough. Thank you for helping me with this portion of the video and making sure I don't spew misinformation on the internet. Because who would ever do that? Please don't do that. First things first, let's start with a die. <laughs> You don't want to know what's going on in German YouTube right now. Oh, oh, you don't want to know. 
Obviously, the probability of rolling any one side of a die is 1 in 6, or about 7. Yeah, that's also a thing. People always think that rolling a 6 is more unlikely than every other number. That is... No, that is not how this works. A 6 is just as likely as a 1. And technically not even true, because no dice is really a perfect dice, so... That technically, one side doesn't necessarily have to be the six. One side is a bit more likely due to these shapings that are on a very tiny level. But, you know, it's very, very small differences. 17%. Let's say I want to roll a four. If I ask you the probability of rolling a four, you'd say one in six, and you'd be right. But how long, on average, should it take to roll a four? Well, there's something called expected value, which is computed by taking the inverse of the probability. So if we take 1 over 6 and invert it, we get 6. That should feel pretty intuitive. Yeah, of course this pops up when I want to take a sip. Uh, Dr. Poopan says, generally the expected value of a discrete random variable x is defined as some kind of e, some well, that's a sick... I, I have no idea what most of these are called. I do kinda understand it, but not really. Uh, where the sum goes over all possible values of x. The inverse of a probability is a special case for this distribution. Intuitive. The expected number of rolls to get a specific face on a die is 6. We could say the same thing about shiny hunting. On average, a hunt with odds of 1 in 8,192 should take 8,192 encounters. But what this expected value can do is lie to you about how likely it is to get the shiny on or before 8,192 encounters. Well, not lie so much as push you in the wrong direction. Just because on average it should take 8,192 encounters doesn't mean it's exceptionally likely to take that many. After all, every single encounter has the same odds as every other encounter to be the shiny one. They're all random and independent. Each roll of my six-sided die is independent of all the other rolls. No one roll can influence the next. And this act of testing the success or failure of something is called a Bernoulli trial. If you know the probability of something, say rolling a four on a six-sided die, then a Bernoulli trial is putting that probability to action. Succeeding, that is rolling a four, has a probability of success P. In our case, one in six. Failure has a probability one minus P since one represents all possible outcomes. This is sometimes represented with a Q. In our case, one minus P is five over six, meaning failure in trying to roll a four is yeah, I would say using a 1 is a bit confusing because you have this 1 in 6 and then 1 minus p, but that 1 is a representative of the 6, not of the 1 you have from before. So it's 6 minus p, the p stands for 1. Yeah, using a q might be very, very more or less, more or less confusing. More or less, yeah, more or less makes total sense is rolling any of the other five sides of the die. In essence, every time you encounter a wild Pokemon when shiny hunting, you're performing a Bernoulli trial. It's just, when compared to our one in six win condition with rolling a four, the win condition for this shiny Bernoulli trial is one in 8,192. But how do we use Bernoulli trials to figure out how lucky or unlucky finding a shiny early or late is? Well- And so, tell me in the comments, do you nickname your Pokemon or do you not? What if I want to know the probability of rolling a four within the first six rolls of my die? Or what about rolling a four after the first six rolls? Well, as you might expect, there are an infinite number of ways to roll a four. You could succeed and roll a four in the first roll, or it might take a hundred rolls, or ten rolls, or a million. This is a chart of simulations I ran in Python. Rolling a die until a four is rolled. Uh, let me try to understand. Number of rolls to get a four. Number of simulations. Okay. This act of trying to roll a four has a certain probability, one in six. This roll until four simulation was repeated over 500 times. Every simulation is plotted here. Six. 
but when trying to measure the probability of it taking a certain number of attempts to roll a four, the probabilities start to become cumulative. The farther you go without rolling a four, the more unlikely the situation as a whole becomes when looked at in context of how long it's taken since the beginning. Each individual roll still has the odds of one in six, but if it takes six rolls, that feels pretty likely, whereas taking not as how, as you might expect, the bars trend somewhat linearly downwards. The more rolls it takes, the more unlikely it is. A hundred feels super unlikely. A plot of the- The only outlier is the 20 plus bar on the far right. That is all simulations that took 20 or more rolls. If we plotted all of those individually, it would flatten out. That is really crazy. The probability of something compared to the number of attempts like this is called a distribution. There Notice how even though 6 is the expected value, it is not the most likely number of trials to roll a 4. The thing is, in the end it's all just luck. Also in Python, randomness can be not as random as you want it to be. It really depends on how you program it. There are lots of common types of distributions, but the main two we're going to focus on today are binomial and geometric. Hey, you still awake? Just checking in on you, because I know this section's got a lot of math, but if you're this far in the video, you probably like it anyway. And if you do like it, consider subscribing, okay? I do like math, actually. I was bad at it in school, but nowadays I like it. For my game, I even needed to create some formulas, and that is something I never did, and quite honestly, it wasn't that hard, well, talking about damage formulas and stuff. Of course, those can become very complicated, but, well. Okay, it's free, the button's right there, and I know YouTubers always say, oh, it helps more than you know, but it genuinely does, because bigger subscriber number equals better brain chemicals, uh, and I need those. Although I cannot formally prove it, I agree with the state. Thanks, Dr. Poopins. Yeah, the problem is that the way YouTube works, Subscriptions don't mean shit anymore. But YouTube still wants you to have a lot of subscribers, so they put you in the algorithm and show you to other people so people watch your stuff. So we do need subscriptions still to monetize and everything like that. Even though with how it works, you really get the videos you are interested in without subscribing to someone. Which is a good thing, just not on the end of the YouTuber. So, if you would subscribe to me, I would also very appreciate it. Listen to this man. Good brain chemicals, so please do subscribe. Also, it'll help you not miss the next upload, which, as opposed to this one, ideally won't take six months to make. Please subscribe. This video was very hard to make. Okay, bye bye, back to the math. I really wanna laser in on these distributions because this is where people so frequently get it wrong when talking about shiny hunting probabilities. They analyze their results with the binomial distribution and use those numbers to justify how lucky or unlucky they might have been. The problem is that the binomial distribution does not apply here. The binomial distribution is made up of a fixed number of independent Bernoulli trials. When we don't know how many encounters it's gonna take to find a shiny, we don't have a fixed number of trials. We have a theoretically infinite number. The binomial distribution is good for analyzing a situation like, if I roll a die six times, what's the probability of getting one four and five of anything else? I know I'm going to roll- Uh, Dr. Pupin says, N is the number of fixed trials. Okay, X is the number of success that happen in those N fixed trials. So this describes the probability of getting that many successes with a fixed end before any trials have happened. Yeah, the thing is what he says, with the dice, you have six possible outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six. With a Pokemon hunt though, each individual Pokemon is an individual. And thus you have, well, technically not limitless, but you have to take into account every Pokemon with every possible stat distribution at every possible level you encountered. I think it was 10 to 12 for Aaron here. And with every possible uh, moveset that was programmed in, that could be different. 
every possible uh, personality they can have, every possible ability they can have, usually two. If I, I'm not sure about Eren if it can have two. I'm not that deep into Pokemon. I enjoy the games, but I don't really care for abilities too much. And if you, like, take all these, especially the stats, which can differ by just one, but that's a different encounter. You have far more than six sides of a die. It's much more than shiny, no shiny. It's much more than that. Roll the die six times, so we have a fixed number of trials at the outset. The distribution obviously has quite a few different permutations of rolling one four out of the six possible rolls, as it can come on the first roll, or the second, or the third, and so on. So when we calculate... The system accounts for the possible different orders. It's a combination function, sometimes called a choose function. To calculate the odds of something like this, we have to include a term in that calculation that accounts for the different possible variations. In shiny hunting, we don't care about that. We want one success as early as possible. There aren't different permutations. We just want to keep going until we succeed. Luckily, the geometric distribution computes just that. The geometric distribution is fairly intuitive to derive, at least in its most basic form. To find the probability that the nth encounter is the first successful one, that is, it's shiny, you just multiply the probability of one success by the probability of failure raised to the power of all of the unsuccessful attempts. So for rolling a die, the probability that the sixth roll is the first successful one for rolling a four, we do one over six times five over six to the fifth power. That gives a result of about 7%. But shiny hunters aren't usually asking what the odds are of getting a shiny on an exact encounter. No, 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 they wanna know the probability of the shiny appearing by a certain encounter. Or the opposite question, how unlucky am I if I still haven't seen the shiny by encounter 10,000 or something? To ascertain the probability that you find a shiny on or before a certain encounter number, you do the same equation we just did, but perform a summation on that equation over n from the first trial up to the desired number. You're basically adding the probability. If n is the number of trials needed to see the first success on a sequence of Bernoulli trials, it is called a geometric random variable. This name is motivated by the fact that formula, since the summation is a geometric series, it is very rare to have a closed formula for this type of function called a cumulative distribution function. Probabilities of each in I honestly, I kind of understand these things, but I could never explain them. Individual case together. You're adding the probability of seeing the shiny on the first encounter to the odds of seeing it on the second and the third and so on up to say the 10,000. To find out how unlucky you are if you still don't have the shiny by 10,000 encounters, you just do one minus that result. So let's try this out on my shiny Aeron. I caught the Aeron on encounter 3,967. The probability of catching Aeron on exactly this encounter is 0.008%. But that number isn't super important as it doesn't really tell you much, since each individual encounter is obviously going to be unlikely saying, what are the odds that I catch the shiny on exactly encounter 40,000, is really unlikely, as all of them are. The odds of getting the shiny within the first 3,967 encounters, however, is much more statistically interesting. That comes out to 0.38, or about 38%. This means I was pretty lucky, as you might expect, given that I was below half odds. If you're doing a full odds hunt on 1 in 8192 odds, you'll get the shiny as fast as I did, or faster, about 38% of the time. Conversely, that means that you have a 62% chance of it taking longer than that. Just for kicks and giggles, let's see the odds of getting a shiny on or before the expected value of 8192. That comes out to 0.63 or 63%. So if you reach odds in a hunt like this, you're only 13% better than a coin flip but you are more likely to have seen it than not to have seen it by this point. I really, really want to stress though that every single encounter is completely independent of all the other encounters. There's a property in probability theory that's relevant here called the memoryless property. These events are independent. Each individual encounter has no bearing. That is what I mentioned in, uh, in the beginning here. It doesn't matter how many encounters you have. Absolutely does not matter. 
I mean, it matters if you're doing like shiny chaining, but it's absolutely obsolete. You have a million encounters, it's not more likely. It's just not. It's the same for every individual encounter. On the next. If you're on encounter 100,000, the game isn't going to go, oh man, they've been hunting for a while. Let's throw them a bone on the next one and make it shiny. Shiny hunting is memoryless by definition. The game doesn't remember that the last 1, 2, 10, or 1,000 encounters haven't been shiny. It doesn't remember anything. It doesn't know anything. It's a game. It's completely random and- Fun fact, the geometric distribution is the only discrete random var variable with the memoryless property. And independent. So although I might say that 91% of shiny hunts for Aeron will have seen it by encounter 20,000, that doesn't mean your odds increase when you cross that threshold or anything. It's still 1 in 8,192 every encounter after that. I will now do the thing you all want me to do, and the thing I promised I would do at the beginning of the video, and show you some clips of people getting unbelievably unlucky and some people getting unbelievably lucky shiny hunting, and then I'll show you the odds. <laughs> Don't consider it haunted, but it's a haunt in its own way, in a different light. <gasps> Seventy thousand encounters. That is a bit. According to the geometric distribution, you are ninety nine point nine eight percent to get this shiny registeel on or before encounter seventy thousand. To get the shiny after encounter seventy thousand, then is point oh two percent or one in. Though keep in mind, maybe he will mention it. This number will arise, sure, but it will never, ever become 100%. There will never be a guarantee. And maybe, maybe they could program in that you have like the 10,000th encounter of a Pokemon is guaranteed shiny. I think some shiny hunters might hate that idea, but just imagine, you have to encounter 10,000 of the same Pokemon. That is like a lot. If they did that, it wouldn't be really a viable shiny hunt. So, so I would be okay with that. In 5,000. You can almost think about this like each individual complete hunt for Registeel as an encounter. 4,999 of those encounters found Registeel well before 70,000. In fact, you're already 99% to have found the shiny by encounter 40,000, let alone 70. But the thing I want to stress here is that although Dallas got incredibly unlucky here, this isn't in the literal sense unbelievable. Is it really unlikely that this hunt took this long? Yes, and I think by his reaction you can tell that Dallas was re Yeah, you have to differentiate between likeliness and actual probability because yeah, we have this almost 100% that doesn't mean that's almost 100% that you have to encounter Shiny at that point. It just means that 99.8, I think it was, percent of Hans would probably encounter it before that number. In the end, I don't think it means anything because, yeah, in the end, each encounter is... Uh, calculated individually and that's just how it is ready for this hunt to be over but those tiny bars off far on the wings of a frequency distribution exist for a reason it can happen and it probably will happen to someone just because something is incredibly unlikely does not mean it's impossible of course there are certain astronomical okay wait a minute wait a minute and it probably will happen to someone just because something is incredibly un list of things that probably haven't happened to anyone yet finding three full odds shinies in a row ah huh. what i had happened that wasn't full odds that was in uh pokemon scarlet and violet i was hunting via a swarm of um 
Uh, what's its name in English? The electric sheep. It's Volti Lamb in German. Uh, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Emperor's first evolution stage. So I found two in that swarm with uh, the help of picnic resetting. And then I was like, okay, I need one more, right? So picnic, nothing. Picnic, nothing. Picnic. There! It's shiny! There! Another shiny! Yeah, I had the shiny charm, I think, at that point. So it was not full odds. And in a swarm. Sure. Well, are they called swarms? Are they called, like, massive encounters? You know what I mean. And I found two at the same time. What else happened to me, and that was in Sword and Shield, was I hatched eggs of... What's the name? Score Bunny. Score Bunny eggs. And I got, uh, like, I always do a, some boxes of eggs, and then I hatch them. <laughs> and I got two shinies. In, in already. So I needed a third one. Okay, so my last five eggs. They were my last five score bunny eggs. The first that hatched. Yes, it's a shiny. Well, okay, let's hatch the other ones. And the fourth of these five eggs was another shiny. I was like, okay, I don't really need you, but I guess I can trade you away, which I haven't yet. So if you need a shiny score bunny and can trade via Pokemon Home, tell me in the comments, I guess. Okay, three Gen 1 misses in a row. Oh yeah, misses in Gen 1 are a weird thing. Unlikely does not mean it's... Missing all 35 of Tackle's PP in a row in Gen 3 with no accuracy. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, shuffling two decks of cards into the same order without forcing. Huh. It's impossible. Of course... Actually experience a cosmic ray bit flip during a speed run. Isn't that what happened in that one Mario uh, speed run? That there was a glitch that only happened due to how the electricity and the surroundings manipulated the data on the cartridge, which is a thing that can happen. That's crazy. He said while listening to Sinnoh Route 216 OST. I'm honestly rarely sad. There are certain astronomically small. Get 42 ender pearls. What are ender pearls? Out of 262 piglin barters and 211 blaze rods out of 305. What is this talking about? All probabilities that haven't happened. Remembering where you set your keys. Impossible. My keys are right if I open the door. There is a shelf there, and there they are. Spelling Aloma Mola correctly on the first try. Aloma Mola. That, that's not hard. Alo Bomo La. Happened, but I want to steer you clear of things. Bringing out why Game Freak insists that l the Lieutenant Surge Jim Trash can puzzle from Kanto continues. Thinking about small probabilities. To be the absolute worst puzzle in all of video games, no matter how many times they remake it. Why are two of the trash cans different colors in Let's Go? I'm so tired. ...abilities as impossible. It's not that it hasn't happened to anyone. It's that it hasn't happened to anyone yet. I do want to stress though that in all- Yes, technically, the monkeys and typewriter thing. <sighs> technically, the monkeys and typewriter thing you have to remember is a thought experiment. So even if you would set an actual, invincible, indestructible, immortal monkey on a typewriter that is also indestructible, and it has endless amounts of paper, so all those are given, and it just smashes the keys. The thought experiment is that he would write every book in history eventually at a point. Which, yeah, technically that would be the thing that at some point needs to happen. However, I have once seen a video on this that took into account that if you just smash your fingers on the keyboard, try doing that. 
open the txt file and try doing that. You will notice that there are some keys you just don't press, which probably has also a name, but some keys you just miss. So who knows if that monkey really or realsies would write that. All of my research, I could not find a shiny hunt more unlucky than this one that was at least documented on video. So uh, Dallas, Godspeed soldier. Thank you for your sacrifice, I'm so sorry. But on the other side of things, it's also incredibly unlikely to have a super lucky hunt, just like it's unlikely to have a super unlucky one. So let's watch a clip of an unbelievably lucky hunt. He's just fast and has a good toolkit for stuff like that. Whoa, no way, shiny swine up? <laughs> I'm sorry if like I was cupping the mic and did that, but that was so fast. That was like, Oh, 16. R-E's? I don't know what that stands for, but probably encounters. Maybe 10 encounters. <laughs> 16 encounters. 16. Full odds. 1 in 8, 1, 9, 2. 16 encounters. Getting the shiny at or below. Yeah, but it can happen. It, it is also possible that you never played a video game. Now you pick up, let's say, a GBA and see this, oh, this cartridge is green, I like that. Pop that in, start a new game, pick a starter, of course the grass type starter, because who wouldn't pick the grass type starters? Weirdos. And it's not the usual green, it's shiny. Your first game ever, your first Pokemon ever, and it could be shiny, it could happen. There is nothing that says it can't. It is absolutely possible. Low 16 encounters is 0.2%. But again, Absol has done hundreds and hundreds of shiny hunts. Throw enough darts at the proverbial dartboard and you are bound to hit a really lucky bullseye sometimes. And you're bound to be- Bullseye isn't even the best thing you can hit in darts. It's the triple 20. The bullseye gives you 50 points, but the triple 20 gives you 60. You don't want to aim for the center. I think that's- actually a flaw in game design i i think whoever invented that dart system didn't really realize what he's doing there be really unlucky sometimes not only that but there are probably hunts documented online that were faster than absol's or longer than dallas's if you know of any hunts like this that have video evidence please shout them out in the comments i would love to see them i've talked loosely about this concept before but there are tons of people playing pokemon at any given moment and I'm not just talking about Twitch streamers or YouTubers. People who've made good life decisions, unlike us, also played these games. Across the millions and millions of people who have played Pokemon, a large swath of those people have seen shinies. If you get even more granular, there are lots of people shiny hunting at any given moment. Maybe not millions, but lots. With that many dedicated people working all the time at getting encounters, crazy things are bound to happen sometimes. For every 50 hunts that take around the expected 8,000 encounters, there are bound to be some that are faster than 100 or longer than 30,000. The clips I've shown you in this video aren't even going to be partially representative of the sheer number of insanely lucky or unlucky hunts that have happened in the world in all of time. Hell, the vast majority of unbelievable hunts probably weren't recorded and they were probably done by hobbyists who don't have an online presence. There are probably tons of examples of people out there who got the shiny they wanted on their very first encounter of the hunt. I will say though, probably a bit less likely are hunts taking a really, really long time that we don't know about. I think it's a bit less likely that people who don't stream their attempts or keep diligent track of their encounter numbers or really love to do this or stream it full time even would ever continue a hunt past 20, 30 or 50,000 encounters. I just feel like there's a little bit less incentive if you're- Yeah, yeah. Personally, I'm aiming for shiny living decks, so I just go for however long it takes. Uh, the way I shiny hunt is when I do my uh, indoor walking, I use the Joy-Con. Joy-Con. I have X always ready. I am making X. Okay, let's go in order. I have X ready, and then I look over the swarms, choose the Pokemon I like, clean out that swarm or massive encounter or whatever they are called. And if I get a shiny, good. If not, 
Well, okay. I use a shiny sandwich from the Mensa in uh, the Blueberry Academy because I am extremely unlucky guarding those Urban Mystica. I have like five. I never get them. So who cares? Yeah, and that shiny sandwich is fine for just general hunting like I do. And that's basically the way I go. And the eggs hatch while I am clearing out that form. How I make the eggs is when I lay in bed, I am always reading something before going to sleep. And on the side, I can just set up a picnic, get that uh, stuff from, from that one town. There, there is a, a meal that gives you egg power. Take that, Pokemon party, go outside of the town, set my ca uh, picnic, and just lay the Joy-Con on the side, on my bed table. And whenever the screen of the Switch goes dark, I press A. That's about every five minutes, two to five minutes, something like that, I press A. Until I notice, okay, I'm not getting any eggs anymore. The meal is probably over, the time is up. Refresh the time, get some more, until I sleep. Easy. It's basically just a side thing I do. I also, when walking, not only do that, but thanks to me having two screens, I can throw up some YouTube at th on top of that. It's easy. It's not the most effective hunt, but it's easily done on the side without paying too much attention, and that's what I like about that. Completely removed from the online world and are just Sorry. doing it on your own. That's not to say that shiny hunters aren't doing it for themselves, they are, but I think putting a camera on it and having it streamed online or recorded to post on YouTube probably influences you a little bit to keep going when the hunt goes really long. After all, when you eventually find it, it's going to be awesome. People are going to go crazy. We had that in this video. It's really cool to see. But I think if you're not posting it anywhere, I just doubt that you're going to make it past 50,000 encounters. At least most people probably wouldn't. With that said, I think the longest hunts ever recorded are probably amongst the longest hunts ever performed. But even then, there might be some hunts we just don't know about that went on super long. Hell, there might be somebody right now who doesn't have an online presence that has been hunting Smeargle for just forever. They're on encounter 500,000, and the day they die, this hunt will pass to their child, and then their child after them. Their entire lineage just damned to remain in Artisan Cave for all of eternity until that damn tail is a different color. At the end of the day, math doesn't care who you are or that you're streaming or recording. Mathematics, probabilities, and entropy chug along as the unseen engines of our universe, completely apathetic to the fact that we exist. But every once in a while, we can throw ourselves at probability, just throw ourselves into the mix, into the cosmic ocean of uncertainty, completely beholden to luck, and let the current just take us on a journey and hope for the best. Shiny hunting is just that. When you hunt, it will shine eventually. There's no guarantee, but almost certainly. How long will it take? Well, that's the fun part. I wish I- Ha! You thought I'd show the clip again, but nope. Surprise! I got more stuff to say. But, uh, oh, oh, can we- Okay, that was nice. <laughs> could, we, could we maybe zoom- Could we, like, zoom it? Could we zoom it? Oh, okay, thank you. It should be pretty obvious, given the topics that I cover in my videos, that I'm pretty passionate about learning and education. But given that you made it this far into this specific video, I'd wager you like learning, too. That means that Brilliant is perfect for you. Brilliant is a delightful online learning platform where you learn by actually doing. Their interactive courses make it super easy to learn and then help you to do the hardest part of learning, which is practicing to keep all of that stuff you just learned inside of your brain. Side note, why is it so hard to remember stuff? Nobody knows? Okay, cool. Well, the bottom line is their interactive tools will help you practice the things you just learned immediately in fun, interactive ways to help you with retention. They also have a wonderful intro to probability section in their data science course. So if you want to take what you learned in this video and keep learning, that's where I'd go next. Plus, they've got courses in programming, math, science, and more. Go to brilliant.org slash ADEF or just click the link in the top of the description and you'll get a 30-day free trial and then 20% off the annual premium subscription if you stick around. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. We made it! It's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it to the end, truly thank you so much. Please consider subscribing if you liked what you saw. Yeah, subscribe, leave a comment, all the good things. This 
was a very interesting video. I did not completely understand everything here, but still, it's pretty cool how the mathematics work and yeah, it you really don't need these extremely complicated formulas if you want to make your own game. They just happen in the background automatically, basically, but yeah, it was interesting and yeah, after all that math talk, our brain is very full now and I think we should start talking about penises now again.